Jakob, welcome back. Hey, thank you for having me again. It's uh, I mean, we were just saying it's probably been a few years now. A lot's happened in the the world in the Salesforce ecosystem, and uh, and you're now an author, uh, a published author. I have the book here. Oh, awesome that uh, it already arrived. Happy to to hear that. Have you had a chance either to take a look inside? I've I've been flicking through. I haven't uh, I haven't sat down, and uh, my my daughter doesn't give me much reading time at the moment. I'm reading books about um, farmyard animals, usually to her. But um, it's definitely something I'm I'm keen to get through. And um, and yeah, obviously the 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 purpose of today is to hear more about it and uh, hear more about your experience in this world of of building apps. Um, I think for the the benefit of listeners, they may have heard the previous episode where where you talked about you know being a CTA having. Um, study buddies and things like that. Johan was on the show with you at the time. Um, they may know you as a CTA, which is great, but you also have a, a, a job. Um, and uh, and I'd love to hear a bit more about what that that job is um, day to day. Sure, happy happy to explain. So I spent most of my time in Salesforce ecosystem working in app exchange related companies and projects. So I spent first few years on the product side working for a different. ISVs as well, ISV first and OEM partners. And then like, I think three years ago, I moved to the consulting part of the business. So I'm currently with Akiva Labs. It's one of expert product development outsourcing companies, which is like probably the smallest niche in the ecosystem because idea of this product development outsourcing PDOs is that as well, ISVs sometimes need help. New ISVs need to sometimes have help to literally build the first version of the package. Mature partners need some help, how to get more from partnership with Salesforce, how to solve some technical problems and so on. And then PDOs are helping literally with providing these consulting services to ISVs. So I would say it's one of the reasons why I was able to write this book because literally working only on the product side always has this change that usually your team is not very big. So you know what you know. But the access to the new knowledge and the new expertise is usually limited because you do not hire very often new people. And people who are in their product team for a long time, of course, they have kind of similar skills that they are. And on the consulting, you see many more things. So that's a good thing. So your your experience with apps um, would be, I guess, from from every aspect, right? So you wouldn't necessarily focus on one industry or solving one problem. You you as a business and, and you as an architect would work across, you know, apps from from solving problems from A all the way through to Z? I think it's a beauty of software development in general that literally you can work with so many different industries and sometimes you can be really impressed that you are not even aware that this industry exists. So for me, like a good example is IPfolio, a um, company which I worked uh, previously, which is the only Salesforce create like Salesforce based system for intellectual property management. And when you think about patent and trademarks, you don't even think that it's a big topic, right? But then you regardless that we are living in the global world, it turns out to literally to every patent office, you have to fill separated documents. They have like different local regulation. And then when you think how many countries do we have across the world? It's so huge industry to like automate and make it the seamless experience for the end users that it was lots of joy and even a personal development to learn this. But then with every new customer and every new industry, you have exactly the same part of really exciting journey to learn something new. And it's one of the most rewarding part of working in PDO space. So when you were when you were on the product development side, how deep would you go in terms of understanding that? product um because you're building it right but did w- would the consultants do a lot of the analysis of the market fit the market opportunity uh-huh. and then the the solution would come to you to design and build or at that point were you getting to to delve into the world of, of what the product was trying to solve that's a great question and i think it's very important for technical people to be humble because of course we are then doing development we are doing architecture so it's easy to start with thinking that we can do it best. With product development, generally, it's a bad idea to start with solution. It's much more meaningful to start with the problem. Focus on what kind of the problem we want to solve, for who we are solving it, so define this ideal customer profile. And it's not simple job, so especially 
On the startup level, you can have like two hats on your head, that's for sure. But sooner or later, having a dedicated product manager who is not going to work with your existing customers, but literally go across the market and doing this analysis is really beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, where did the idea come from to, to turn your knowledge into a book? <laughs> That's an awesome question. So I started some time ago making public presentations about publishing apps on the app exchange. I was like a few times on the Infos, once on TDX. And I started feeling that, you know, at the beginning, I was not even sure is it going to be a good topic because it's still on the niche. But I've had like lots of people, lots of good feedback from this event. And at the beginning of the day, I had even a situation where like, they asked me like to come to TDX. Firstly, I had like another invitation to Uruguay. So I spent like 60 weeks in a row out of Europe. And then I thought, okay, maybe it's a little bit too much. And it would be nice to find other way to share this knowledge if people are asking for it. So I hope, yeah, book is exactly the answer how to help me in doing my job, because then I can as well use it for internal training of people in my department and as well help other people to maybe make something meaningful on the app exchange. It's interesting because I speak to so many people that work in the Salesforce ecosystem and so many people say, you know, one day I'd like to build an app. I'd love to, you know, I've got a few ideas. And what, what do you think stops people from turning their, their vision of building an app into the reality of actually launching something on the app exchange? You know, it's a great question because people who are you talking about, I think it's the biggest advantage of being a consultant. You work with customers, you see their problems, and from this, you can have really useful idea. What's stopping people with making this idea into reality is exactly what I felt first time when I thought about building my own app. That app exchange is a huge topic and there are many, many things which you have to learn about. And at this moment, it's very difficult to find this knowledge because like, it's not only about the technical part, how to build the app. It's as well how to become Salesforce partners. So there are different kinds of contracts. You need to define pricing for your app and so on. Then you have to think about go to market, marketing, making your listing. And usually there are many things which you don't know that you should study about. So like first time when I started to get this knowledge, like at the beginning of my Salesforce career, I just felt so overwhelmed by amount of these things. And even if you will try to go directly to Salesforce and get some advice, you will find awesome technologies who can help you with scalability of your app. You will find as well awesome go-to-market experts, but usually these people are working with different departments and their focus is on big successful ISVs. So if you, have, you are a new partner and you want to do something on your own, you are not going to be a priority for them, right? So then you are still on your own. And I hope that my book is going to help with this, that at least all the knowledge is like in a one place. So after you read it from end to end, you know what you should master. And I'm not saying that after reading in once, you are going to get all the skills. It's the other lecture which you can go back after half year, after one year, and then think again about some topics. But at least the journey is going to be much easier to imagine from this moment. And you would work with um, established companies as well as startups, right? So companies that already might have other products or might have a product in market that needs some, some assistance to improve, as well as working with companies that have an idea and they, they just want to get something built, right? Exactly. So uh, I would say in Akiva Labs, we have literally two types of customers. New startups who want to build their first app, and for example, they don't have Salesforce expertise, it's like then pure development of MVP. But as well, we are helping mature ISVs who are struggling with some things. And it can be, for example, the long onboarding process of new customers. It can be security review submission, which is happening every few years. And for many ISVs, it's a quite big surprise how many technical debt and vulnerabilities they added meantime. And it can be entirely anything as open as how to get more from your Salesforce partnership. Because when you think about all this ISV slash OEM business model, Salesforce charge a percentage of your application license fees. And it's like a lot. I mean, it, you are paying for lots of features and it's good to get as most as you can from this platform. So if you are not utilizing some available tools because you never heard about them, it means that you are overpaying. And it's something as well what we are usually helping to 
make the best usage of what is available to partners. So what's the quickest you've seen a startup go from an idea to a listing on the app exchange? I would say it's doable in a few months because the one thing which is always going to take some time is the security review. After the application is like ready for the review, you submit it until you get the results going to take on average two months. Uh, most of ISVs fail the security review on the first attempt. Why? It's like, first of all, it's not easy process. There are like many things which you have to learn. And if you are doing it first time in your life, it's what I'm even recommending in my book. Do not have expectation that they are going to pass it in the first attempt. Passing in the second on the third is a realistic one. And it's generally a good thing because then probably are going to learn something new. If you will go to PDO partner, we are passing security views like a few times per month in different projects. So then the chances that it's going to be in the first attempt is strongly increasing. In terms of the how much time you should spend on building the app, I think it's a beauty of Salesforce platform that you can deliver lots of value in a very quick time. And for building MVP, for publishing something new, you should not of make it over complicated because we know that we can build this stuff, but you don't know, are you going to find customers who are going to pay for it? So mm -hmm. the idea of MVP should be really small. And I would say one or two months of development and then one or two months of waiting for security review, make it realistic to say that from idea to publish listing, like in a quarter, you can aim if your idea is very small, from quarter to half year is like realistic. Anything more than a half year probably means that your MVP scope is too big and you should think about this twice. So MVP should literally just be a couple of small use cases from the bigger picture. Yes, because um, people somehow miss the idea that MVP should be not everything what you think is going to be a full product. MVP should be a sm smaller subset of your idea, which can deliver enough value to anybody to convince this person to pay for usage of your application. If you struggle to find the score of your business, you can then spend unlimited amount of time, money, resources for building something, but still maybe you won't be able to find anybody. So literally we should think that at the beginning you have an idea which is kind of a hypothesis that someone is really looking for a solution to this problem. And it's like definition of innovation. Thing which is innovative, must not only be novel, but as well useful. And in the business context, useful means that it's useful enough to pay for it, right? So finding people who are paying for it's like critical step of the building real product. What, what about when, um, like I've spoken to numerous people before and they have an idea and then they go and look on the app exchange and there's already a product there. Like, would you recommend that people stop because there's already an option or, or is, is it still worth going and doing the research, understanding the gaps of that product. Like if, if, a, if a company have already got a product out there, surely they've got that competitive advantage. They can pivot, they can add functionality. Like, is it worth trying to compete with what's already there? So I would not recommend to trying to make one-to-one -one copy of something that already exists. It's probably would require you to make, first of all, a big analysis of this app, and then it's starting to be kind of unethical. But the question is, if your idea is similar and what is unique in your idea? So then we are starting to speak about your ideal customer profile and product market fit. And literally you should be able to name one thing, one problem, which your idea, your solution is like the best tool in the world to solve a specific problem for a specific customer. And maybe for example, there is either some solution which is generic and you are going to make a dedication version for healthcare or for automotive industry, right? So you should Or just... maybe it's like still up with Salesforce Classic interface and your competitive advantage is going to be something really modern. Like I, I hope there are not many apps using still Salesforce Classic, but you know what I mean? Then like Spring Greeks can be like what you are going to focus on. Because I hear a lot of people say, oh, look, I found this app, but it's so expensive. I could just charge less. Uh, you can charge less. And then, you know, it's a little bit about business discussion because uh, what, uh, and it's uh, out of the scope of my book, so it's, let's say, a side topic. Uh, when you are pricing your 
application, you should not only think what you see a cost of development. So, you know, you are doing it in the afternoons, in the weekends. So cost of development is zero dollars. So it would be nice to charge like five bucks, right? No, it, it's more meaningful to think how much value you can create for your customer and how much of this value you can catch. Trying to be a cheap competitor from, because I did like some business education at Stanford Graduate School of Business. And long story short, if I learned something during this one year is that trying to be the cheapest, it's not the best option. Trying to be the best usually is much more profitable. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So if you think about um, like trends that you've seen, companies have a great idea, they come to you, but it, it doesn't work, like it fails. What, what have you noticed to be like common between the companies that end up in that situation? Mm -hmm. So I would say there are like two main factors. One is the technology per se. There are many ISVs who are trying to build apps on their own or just go to the local consulting partners. The tricky part is that local consulting partners know how to do Salesforce development, but then making the proper architecture for managed packages, it's a little bit different. And the challenging part is that some mistakes after you add them to the package and the release on your customer orgs are going to stay with you forever. There are literally no easy way to solve some problems. So these early mistakes can be a significant blockers when you go out from having first two or three customers and you would like to scale your product. And the second big thing is spending too much time on development without trying to find the real customers. So if literally you are adding more and more features, you are adding more and more complexity to your product. And from this moment, if you still cannot find someone really using this app, there is a chance that the market doesn't exist. And that as well means that probably you are starting to burn money from some moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that must be a pretty confronting situation to find yourself in as a, as a startup to just no one's using it. And you know, I think it's, not only for startups, it's like the same reasons why people are buying stocks and staying with them when they are losing value for too long and so on. It's human nature. So literally having a good one at the beginning. For example, in Akiva Labs, we recently published the application called Ask Your Document. It's like a generative AI tool, which allows you to ask questions to your Salesforce files, context, this kind of the stuff. And as part of our, of our strategy for this, we set a plan that, okay, we have specific timeline when we expect to get like users, specific number of paying customers for like specific months. And if after half year, we are not going to hit this revenue market, then we are going to probably come to the point that it's not worth to continue this development. So literally then after you are optimistic and full of hope that you are going to conquer the world, you make a plan, what is going to be your decision if your expectations are not going to be met. And then in the worst case, after half year, you are starting to do something else. It's much better to spend half year than like spend two years, right? And adding more and more investors money to add more and more features if just there is no market for your product. Yeah, like that. And you're right in saying like people kind of hang on to the losers for too long, right? Because they're, they're emotionally invested in that. Like I know of some people that have been building a product for like six years and haven't released anything. Yes, and then again, it can be the best product for you, but are there only, are other people who will one day appreciate it, probably hard to say. Yeah. And you know, what is even the more tricky, adding more features to the product means that you are increasing the complexity of changing anything. So even if one day you will find these early customers, for sure they are going to like some of your ideas and some dislike. And from this moment, you are increasing costs of adapting your product to their requirements. So it's another like thing which is not widely common and I'm covering it in a chapter about technical debt that on the level of the idea, building successful products is not only about adding more and more features, it's as well about removing features and thinking what is the core of your offering. So uh, there are like a few different ways of doing it. Some people are into design thinking. Personally, I'm a big fan of framework called the jobs to be done. And it's entirely about asking yourself a question, why someone is hiring my product to solve a specific problem? What is this problem? So what is a core of my functionality? And if something is not catching this vision of your product, 
probably it doesn't make sense to add this feature. Maybe you should create another product. Maybe you should like think about something else, but try to keep your offering simple and clear because it helps you not only with development, but with your go-to-market, with marketing, with message to potential customers. Like the consistency of your idea is as well a critical factor. So have you seen products that you thought were brilliant just not get the market that like you, you thought there was a market fit there, you thought it was a great product, but then the go-to-market strategy just didn't quite work for the company? Mm, I've seen a few of them. Uh, not only in the app exchange ecosystem, like, but probably the biggest thing which was like very loud in the last years was a metaverse. And like, I remember like thinking about this because I didn't feel this product. I didn't feel this idea, but I was trying to be as humble as possible. And I was saying, okay, guys working on this for sure have more experience, more knowledge, very big paychecks. They know all this theoretical knowledge, which I know. So maybe there is something would be missing. But after a few years, you know, we are where we are, right? So yeah. I think it was like quite heavy investment and we will see. If, if I'm still wrong or if it's just going to die silently. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So how, how has um, being a CTA helped building apps and, um, and helped customers? Because it's not the, the role that you have isn't the traditional path for a CTA, right? And we've, we've discussed that before, but like you, you, there aren't many CTAs in the world building app exchange products. That's for sure. And it's not like, simple answer because like there are many things in the CTA scope related to, for example, governance, which are not pretty useful in the startup environment. On the other hand, one of the parts which people usually complain during the exam is the fact that you have to memorize lots of limits, lots of integration patterns and so on. And I will tell you a secret. I hope nobody is going to take out from me the certificate that after three years, I already forget the exact numbers, but you keep in mind that these numbers are important. And for example, when you are building the new version of the app, it doing you about that number of platform events, number of custom metadata records, and so on. All these things which works well on your developer environment can blow up after the release of the application to real customers. And in ISV space, it's even a little bit more tricky because you are spending a few months on development, then a few months on the security review process, then ISV is starting to search for a customer, so probably another few months before onboarding of something. And then after half year, if someone installed the app and start using it, probably your team is already working on something totally different. So then going back and rebuilding something very quickly because you have your first customer waiting for you can be a big challenge. And I had quite a few times when on the level of review of the solution proposed by my teams, I was able to just ask the right questions to catch this kind of the mistake. So I would say, not saying that it's like CTA only kind of knowledge. You can as well have this knowledge just by being a very good non CTA architect, but definitely it's still like worth to have this technical expertise to build a good applications. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, makes sense. And obviously, you've mentioned the review board is um, <clears throat> is challenging. Not everyone passes it first time. Not everyone should expect to pass it first time. But are there some key factors that you think high level people should think about if they're not using a company like yours? as they're going through the security review process? So probably the first step would be to go to the tailhead and go through the content about security review there to understand the process itself. And then recently Salesforce published the, the security scanner, which is like available for free. And it's doing very good job with finding some vulnerabilities. So it's not solving all the problems, but the first step probably would be to really get what you can from these public sources and then try to define your software development process to make sure that you are running this static code analysis with, after every pull request and so on. And then I would say there are some things which are not very well documented. And when you think about the security review process as well, uh, there are people following some checklists and some of them are great experts. Some of them are maybe new employees doing it as well first on the, on the second time. So from this moment, there's as well some element of luck at the end. And the good thing is that it's not end of the world if you fail. So we tell you are going to get the response with the vulnerabilities. If you don't agree with some of them, you can go for the office hour and discuss. If they found some vulnerabilities, it's generally good that they found this, right? So like 
comparing to other industry standards, the security review process is really making publishing apps of the app exchange meaningful because then it's helping you to sell this application. Your customers are not afraid about security because if they test safest process, it means that you do not have to fight with their security or legal department. Right? So generally having it at the end, it's helping you, not it's not an obstacle. Mm-hmm. So once someone's passed, the, a company passed the, the security review, is just having the listing on the app exchange enough to bring customers in? Oh, that would be helpful, right? <laughs> but, you know, um, it a little bit depends on what kind of app are you building. If it's something very generic and dedicated, especially for technical people like administrators or consultants, then maybe yes, because for example, my application like is available for free, it's called Formula Debugger. It allows with debugging Formula fields. I literally published it three years ago because to have access to lots of tools available to ISVs, you need to have at least one, one app on the security review passed and available on the app exchange. But then of course, when I'm speaking with my customers, I'm not going to show them details of application for my another customer. So having one product, which is my intellectual property, and I can use it for demos, just make my life easier, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and for this kind of the app, which literally allow only you to debug formula fields, app exchange is enough because administrators struggling with debugging put the right word in the search and find it. But this application is free and I have no expectations about any financial input. For any real product which you are planning to monetize, App Exchange is nice to have, but to have a good promotion need, you can either go together with Salesforce via uh, the marketing program, and then they are helping to promote your listing. Or probably sooner or later, you need to have a dedicated sales and marketing people, and generally it's what we call go-to-market. So uh, building the app is not the most difficult part of building a startup, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's so interesting that, that I think that's, often not an area people would have experience in, right? They, they, they might be technical, they've seen this gap in the market, but that's really where the, the, the most challenging part of that fit that comes along, right? Because how do you get it to the right people in a, such a, you know, a, a, where, where use cases can be so varied and, you know, the, the perfect user might be in America, but you're in Australia and like, how, how do you even tackle that? I'm not asking you to answer that because, uh, that would be a, a you know the million dollar uh, the million dollar answer, but uh. I have a thing that one of the best ways to come with the idea for the product is literally working as consultant or developer with the real customers and seeing similar problems across few companies. Because from this moment, you have like a few potential customers who maybe even are not going to need your product because you are solve it as a consultant for them, but they are going to give you valuable feedback. And if you've seen the same pattern in a few different places, then there's a big chance that this problem really occurs. And then like finding another customer who didn't yet use your consulting service, but then would be your early customer, it's much more easy than if you think that you are solving million dollar problem, but you never met anybody who really wanted to pay for this problem. Yeah. I, I If you think of um, like some of the successful companies out there, like the Oda Savers of this world, places like that, that that is how the product came to life, right? They were involved in a, a, an engagement with a, a customer that needed to back up a, a lot of data. Um, I'd love to know like where things like DocuSign and um, Conga and, and where they came from. But um, yeah, I've never been able to get to the founders of those to ask the questions. But uh, I'm sure there's new product ideas coming up every day that will go on to have similar success to, to the ones we've mentioned. Uh, definitely. Like another great example is... Uh a travel product company called Capture from Iceland. And when you think about Iceland as a country, it's rather small, but it has like very strong touristic industry. So their founders spent lots of time doing customization of Salesforce as a consultant. And then one day, three years ago, they came to just building a product at top of this consulting experience, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. So what are some of the, the apps that you use day to day, some of your favorite app exchange products that maybe you haven't built, but you can't live without? So there is one available for free, which I'm a big fan by. It's called Package Visualizer. And it's especially useful for ISVs because thinking about the history when people used one first generation managed packages, it was literally a Salesforce org where you 
upload the package, and then you modify everything on this org, right? With the new generation, second generations of managed packages, the flexibility is much bigger. The developer experience is much better, but everything you are going to do via command line. And from this moment, like having access to analytics of your app, pushing upgrades, so installing new version of your app to your customers and so on via command line. Even for me as a technical person, it's not so convenient as having a nice user interface. And this created by Salesforce Labs application called Package Visualizer is so nice. I mean, it's solving all my problems as ISV. I'm promoting it to every of my customers. And the best part is for free. So I would say, if you are thinking about it, as well, I'm describing it in my book, it's one of the first things which probably you should install in your part-time business org because it's going to help you with many activities. Nice, nice. Yeah, great tip. And where can people find the book if, uh, if they're interested and they want to get their hands on a copy? So the best place and the easiest is to go to Amazon because Amazon delivers it to so many different regions and then you do not have to struggle with sending it across the seas and so on. As well, you can find it on my publisher, Spark, the webpage. Awesome. And if anyone wants to ask you any questions, reach out, pick your brains, where's the best place to find you now? I think the LinkedIn is the easiest channel. I'm in this age when I'm not a Twitter person, still not sure is it like Twitter or X or is it going to collapse very soon or not. So reaching out to me on LinkedIn probably is going to be the best option. Awesome. Well, I, I feel inspired to come up with some app ideas now and, uh, and get something out there. So uh, haven't got anything yet, but you'll be the first person to hear from me when I do. Awesome. I'm going to keep my finger curled. Thank <laughs> you, man. Thank you so much.